So it is my great pleasure to introduce Dominic Kremer and Blake Walker. Uh, Dominic Kremer is a research assistant currently at the Institute of Geography at Friedrich Alexander Universität Erlangen. And he studied geography and wrote his PhD in applied computer science on the topic of modeling places as social phenomenon, geoinformatic analysis of semantically enriched behavioral data. And Blake Walker is a professor of human geography and digital transformation at the same institution. And one of his research focuses uh, is the digitalization of placial cultural narratives in digital media and critical analysis of open worlds in video games. And today they'll be talking about exploring individual sense making of virtual landscapes in video games. So the stage is yours. Go ahead. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. And um, oh, I believe we've lost the slides there. Dominic, can you share your slides again? Or Wonderful, yeah, thank you. Um, I'll, I'll speed through here just to try and recover a few minutes' time. So um, thank you kindly for the introduction. As, as it's clear, our, our backgrounds are both within human geography, cultural geography, and in this kind of space, and are, are fairly fresh in the um, video game studies, video game science, game science scene. And what brought us here is something that I'd like to trace over the next, uh, over the next minute or so before handing the, uh, the microphone over to Dominic. Just as an opening remark, in our title, we speak of sense making within these video game spaces, but we see this as sort of a necessary methodological increment forward towards meaning making in the palatial or human geographical sense. And I'll describe that in a bit more detail in a second. Can you jump the next slide there? So a quick um, overview here of what we intend to discuss over the next 16 minutes. And essentially what we're doing is um, tracing a trajectory from a fundamental gap that we see within human geographical theory in the context of digitalization um, with its many faceted definitions and how we seek to and are presently working to fill a methodological gap there that will enable us as cultural geographers to um, analyze these spaces in a, in a, in a context uh, sensible manner, let's say. Next slide, please. Quick background about who we are. Um, we are a, as well, Dominic and myself, we run a rather eclectic research group which stems out of epidemiology and health geography in the classical quantitative sense and more recently has um, been merging in ideas about digitalization within society, digitalization as an individually experienced phenomenon um, and above all is underscored by uh, conceptualizations of space and how that's perceived and experienced. And so we're making fundamentally the argument that when we're operating within a geostatistical realm, when we're operating within a classical health geographical realm, for example, we are indeed engaging in the same type of exploratory play uh, that one might see in a fundamental phenomenological sense um, as one does in the open world video game. And out of a variety of discussions over the last two years, we came to this concept where could we not explore these ideas as cultural geographers in an open world video game space? Rather, the concepts that we take out of, out of a health geographical or even other um, uh, cultural ge geographies into that. And so the focus here is on the concept of playful exploration. And this is sort of coalescing around a current project called STAGE, Spatial Transcoding and Analysis in Game Environments. So with that introduction, I'll hand the microphone over to Dominic and you can, uh, you can take the reins. Thanks, Blake, for introducing us. Just a brief remark on my person. I have been a student assistant in developing geo games at the Chair of Computing and the Cultural Sciences in Bamberg um, since 2002 <clears throat> and uh, was a project lead at the same chair in my, during my time of my PhD thesis on a game, uh, on a project called Geo games and playful geo design, where we tried to merge these two fields of really explore, exploring in a sense of serious gaming um, geo design tasks by playful approaches. Um, just to our study that we wanted to to introduce here, it will be published within, I would say, hours <laughs> or days uh, on the Zeitschrift für Digitale Geisteswissenschaften. So this is a, a, a actual um, actual current publication we are reporting from today. Um, I will switch now to the to the scripted mode just to save time, <laughs> but um, um, it is, might be convenient for you. Um, as other leisure activities like watching movies, video games provide support for the escapist fantasy. 
to have a backstage that is not bound by everyday social commitments and obligations pointer to Harald. Um, this does not prevent uh, games of being an anchor for social activity, of course. This is why my question <laughs> uh, came from, and, but it just opens a new social space with new opportunities to playful approaches of, of serious problems. Other than mo movies, and this is the most prominent um, difference maybe, uh, video games allow for situational decision making like the avatar we saw before on, on really acting on the uh, uh, game environment you are currently in. So beside the game narrative and game mechanics, uh, there's still plenty of space for play, for gameplay, for exploration. And this is exactly what Heisinger determined to be as well as the creation, as well as the recreation of uh, society and culture, of course. Of course, individual gameplay reflects the socio-cultural background of the player, again pointer to Harald, but at the same time it enables exploration uh, of can I do that here scenarios. Not a surprise, those can I do that here scenarios relate back to the virtual environment in which a player acts, and as we all know, a lot of effort has been put into the technical development of gaming hardware over the last 40 years to allow for playing experiences almost consistent with everyday physics. Those stages offer anchors for spatial awareness and of individual gameplay framed by tasks and expectations as we will see in a second. So um, the task and the expectations and the intentions you bring with you structure uh, to a large degree uh, the, the type of gameplay you are, you are, you are doing. As we are from cultural geography, of course, space is always assisted by scale. And so maybe it doesn't surprise that another anchor that we had in our analysis is the other uh, zoom levels on which you look at the spatial setting in a game. For example, objects like trees, settings like a village or a marketplace, or the whole area in which your vantage point is situated and which relates to the concept of landscape, at least in the English-speaking work. For the German-speaking audience, landscape is not quite the same like Landschaft in German because Landschaft only points to an open landscape and in a very aestheticizing sense. Um, to the right, you see the game where we did our um, study on it's a first-person perspective on the landscape of the game, The Long Dark. <laughs> A Long Dog is a post-apocalyptic survival game uh, situated in a perfect wilderness uh, in a location framed as Canada. <laughs> and there's no electricity, no communications, no other human beings around, and we have to learn to survive in the remnants of human civilization just as long if enough to learn about what really happened. <laughs> and so this is maybe the perfect stage of doing analysis on um, the use of landscape in video games. Just to give you two hints of a theory background from cultural geography addressing the intersection of the socio-cultural realm and the spatial realm. First is um, of these two phenomenological approaches is Creswell, who rephrased the concept of mobility to be the sense making or meaning making of bodily movement through an environment. No matter if you dance, if you go hiking or if you commute to your working place. As Cresswell published a second book, Place, a short in introduction two years earlier, it is obvious that in this approach, mobility integrates paths along places, areas of interest that attract or at least structure your movement. There can be basic affordances. For example, a stone tells you to sit down, stages like a market or symbols that are deliberately from the developer side or occasionally from the reader side recognized as cultural symbols. A second important theory is schütz luckmanns approach to living environments, where the concept of attention is very important, a, content, a constant stream of consciousness, whether you are sitting at a place or tracking down a rolling panorama on the move. In doing so, schütz luckmann describes social practice, which is often analyzed only in a static manner in social sciences, as content constantly put to the test by individual decision making. And this is exactly what we are interested in. So we, we do not want to look for the big, powerful, hegemon, hegemonic discourses governing everything. It's quite in contrast. We want to look for the small, interrogating, challenging, playful actions, renegotiating socio-cultural settings all the time in everyday life, but especially in gameplay, where these social boundaries become a little bit weaker. 
as our um, study had a methodological um, impulse as well, uh, we tried to switch from what Harald uh, told to be um, close playing, so um, intense playing and observing by being the social actor in the game. We tried to extend it to a, to a second level and we were, were inspired by the geographic method of walk-alongs. Um, Degen Rose 2012 um, distinguished between the person in acting and the person observing. So you had one person playing and you observed that person playing and, and not only the game. So this is maybe the second step that we that we post into it. And it is, if you like, a close reading of mobility in Creswell's sense, which we tried to uh, conduct. Interestingly, Degen and Rose findings cover that uh, findings by applying their method uh, cover that streams of consciousness in well-known environments are often pure streams of activated memory, and this is exactly what we observed in games as well. So, if you if you have someone open a game for the first time, then the people tell you something like, "This is just like." Um, Assassin's Creed just worse. <laughs> and so there's all the, always this dream of activated memory when you get into a game. Uh, and so our main questions are, is there only a pre-rendered discourse in, in, the, in the sense of a staged authenticity that is decoded and complied to by the players? Or is this base for the creation of culture in the sense of Heisinger, or at least an ongoing challenge of socio-cultural expectations in the sense of schutz -Luckmann? This is maybe the question that, that is to the key of our, or the heart of our interest. Um, we chose, uh, uh, as we did our study during the times of the lockdown, we had to look for a pretty controlled lab setup to assure all players had equal um, conditions. We are not uh, cognitive uh, scientists, we are social scientists, but we needed to have our results comparable. Um, so first of all, um, we uh, we chose Discord as a streaming platform, which is a well-known platform for sharing individual gaming experience in, in the game world. In parallel, we did a screen recording in the background for later close media analysis. We defined a controlled setup path into the game to make sure that hardware was suitable, that it, we had an, an, an balanced starting point in the game and that none of the players had played the game before. The one and central task uh, for the players was now play the game the way you explore new games, speak to it. There were observation nodes of two observing coders in the experiment uh, to check for intercoder reliability. Interventions were only reduced and carefully set to keep self-reporting of the player going and not to, to biasing uh, someone or, or, or to spoiler some uh, elements of the game. After the playing session, we did a detailed analysis of key frames and key scenes um, we extracted. In, in doing that, we, we rely on the, on the general purpose ontology, as I would frame it as a computer scientist, um, of image schemata from Johnson 1987. And, um, this, uh, this um, is an inventory of, of, of abstract elements in the visual realm that can be translated to language elements easily. And there has been a number of applications since the late, late 90s in computer science of exactly using, um, image schemata as a translation representation between the visual and language. For example, um, some um, categories from this inventory are enablement, so um, places that allow you for certain actions, attraction places you invest movement on to get to, or counterforce when agents prevent you from reaching a place of your desire. In our study, we did uh, five intense digital walk-alongs in the game The Long Dark, which produced three usable screen recordings of about 45 minutes, e minutes each. From our observation notes, we identified highlight sequences, which we analyzed in detail later on. And on the next four slides, I will give you a few examples of our findings. Case one, affordances, <laughs> modeled by the code's attraction and enablement on a small scale object indicated by the by the S uh, in the in the last um, uh, um, uh, line of the table. By seeing a fire on the grill, the player stated, "It doesn't get more romantic than that." Damn, I didn't bring anything to grill, <laughs> and then he decided to sacrifice a can of peaches to put at least something on the grill. <laughs> So this is some kind of play in the play uh, in the game, if you like. Uh, uh, then second one, spatial decision making. 
um, in this case, a clear path to the right of the of the screenshot was already explored leading to buildings. And uh, nevertheless, the player decided to invest an exploration loop to an up to an old mine in the mountains, stating, hmm, mine or civilization? <laughs> so the exploration loop be became more prominent than the really uh, compliance to the to the game target. Third, and of course, as cultural geographers, we were very keen to get statements like this. Uh, in this case, the first glance, uh, right after starting the game, on a distant snow-covered mountain range, set the intention set of the player for the rest of the playing session in his efforts to get there. <laughs> of course, I'm attracted by the mountains back there. <laughs> he didn't even he did only invest uh, as much as, as as necessary to survive to really uh, follow his task to go to the mountains. <laughs> And uh, last but not least, breaking expectations um, in consistency with everyday physics. Um, the, expectation, the expectations was constantly put to the test. In this case, the player chose to walk deliberately on a frozen river to see if she would break through. These are four uh, strong examples of play in the game um, that are not compliant to the to the rules of the game. Um, in this in um, Looking at these different scenes, 16 in sum, we found several structural similarities and dissimilarities, which we now can formalize uh, due to the image schemata. Example one, uh, structural similarity. We call it a structural similarity when different places induced similar schemata with similar intentions. The picture on the left shows a frozen lake and a tree trunk um, in the other case that blocked the path of the players and caused deviations from an intended pa path on both occasions. This is really on small scale objects because you need to find a way around. The second um, example shows a structural dissimilarity. In this um, case, we are talking about the same place, but from different point of views. <laughs> so we are looking on, on this road, orthogonal and, and collinear in, in, in these uh, both uh, ways. And um, uh, in one case, the road is clearly a path to follow as uh, image schema. And in the other, it's just an obstacle on your way to a far distant barn in the back, and it is crossed without further notice. <laughs> so you can have the same place, different intentions, different image schemata, and uh, different places with the same image schemata, of course. Come, uh, now um, to our results. Um, first, the main findings looking on these 16 uh, scenes were, if you are not skilled, you have no fun playing around. <laughs> Uh, the more you are new to the game, you want to comply to the rules, and the more um, experienced you are or the more expectations you have from other similar games, the more you are likely to play around. Then a second, um, if you have um, an active intention set uh, that is like, I want to go to this red barn back there, your eyes are on the task and not on the streets that might lead you to, to civilization in, in the middle ground. If you have empty intention sets and do not know what to do with the game, you will either react quickly on anything that uh, gets your attention or you will simply try to break the game. <laughs> One of our participants very much disliked the game and from that moment on, he just tried to break the ga game on every occasion he had. <laughs> And uh, second, and the last one is, is the one with the snow-covered mountains. Um, if you have higher level intentions going on, goals like or something like that, they might stay active for a long time, for more in an hour or, or so in an effort to just get to the mountains. We come to a conclusion. Um, first of all, we, we think that digital walk-alongs capture individual experiences very, very well. Uh, and this is not even limited to the realm of, of video games. You can use it on any digital media in our belief. Um, and second one, our placial phenomenological approach uh, proved to be an appropriate field practice in digital spaces to discover what how spaces are constructed, how they are used, and how they are socio-cultural bound or explore, explored. And um, as we saw it, active intentions provide a powerful filter on experiences, words, especially game words, and expectations are intentionally broken by active playful engagement during playing the game. So on for, for the final words, over to Blake again.
Okay, cool. Thank you. Yeah, so um, as, as, as Dominic presented here, what we have and, and hopefully forthcoming in this publication is a, a methodological increment towards understanding and, and deconstructing these spaces or more precisely the experience of these um, places uh, through a human or cultural geographical lens. What's missing at this point still, um, as it's early days, is a lot of uh, what we gathered from, from uh, Harold Kohlberg's presentation, for example, is, is theorizing the individual in that space and, and learning to place that in, in, a, in a socially meaningful and, uh, say, philosophically constituted manner. The next step is, of course, understanding how to integrate more of these socio-cultural framings and elements into our digital phenomenology, if, if we might be so grand as to say it. Um, but crucial here will be learning how to contrast these types of experiences and these negotiations of the space and its constraints, for example, in the long dark, as, as Dominic presented, to sense making and perhaps more importantly, meaning making in the real world environment. Can we take somebody and drop them off in Arctic Canada and see if they survive, for example? I mean, we can do this in a much more um, scientifically and ethically valid manner, let's say. And so this is kind of the next increment. And so we're very pleased um, to have had the opportunity to present that with you today. And we'd like to thank you all for your attention and, and look forward to your thoughts and discussion. Thank you very much.